So in today's video, I'm just giving you an update on our homeschool situation, and I have a pretty big update. Hi everybody, welcome back to Project Happy Home. For those of you who are new here, I'm Tanya, a doctor, lawyer turned homeschool mom of three kids ages 11, eight, and six. Right. In homeschool, I have a huge announcement. We are scrapping fall 2020 entirely, and we are restarting the school year as January to November homeschoolers. It is very surprising to me as well. But when I was reflecting on like how I was gonna do spring, how we were gonna get everybody back up to speed, what we were gonna do, I just realized, you know what, I don't want to. I don't wanna try to catch up. I don't wanna have that stress on me. I don't wanna feel like, well, we're this many weeks behind in this. So I'm just restarting and I'm gonna pretend like fall 2020 was just an extended experience of the pandemic and quarantine and wasn't part of our school year at all really. Which is nice, actually, because my favorite parts about it were our little reject wild and free group. But basically, it was one of the best things to happen out of 2020 because the five families that, you know, were mask wearing, were taking all the appropriate pandemic precautions, etc., got together and made our own little reject wild and free group. And it's been great. And I've loved getting to know these families. And I just really enjoy being with like-minded people. And we know that we're being very safe. And so when we get together, it's really very pod-like and all of our gatherings have been outside, etc. So it's been great. And I never did a curriculum lineup video for the girls and the girls are like hybrid grades. So my middle child is like a hybrid second, third grader. She's like third grade for math and science, but she's second grade for language arts. And my youngest is really like kindergarten for language arts and first grade for math and science, etc. I've had a very different experience teaching each of my children to read. My eldest truly just taught himself. My eldest has ADHD. Um, somehow he just taught himself how to read when he was four. When he was four and a half, he was easily reading like Mo Willems books and, and you know, early readers and things like that. With my middle child, she had a little bit more difficulty. You know, when she was four, I was sort of that mom who was like, oh, well, you're gonna learn to read too. And she didn't, and I wasn't too stressed out about it, but by the time she got to be five, I thought, okay, so I guess I'll get you a book because you're not reading on your own yet. And I started her off with teach your child to read with 100 easy lessons. And it was slow going. She had a lot of pushback. It's a very dry and boring book, even though it's effective. She was picking it up, but she was a little bit grumpy about it. So I threw in the reading lesson as well, which is 20 easy lessons. It's really not 20 lessons. It's a very big book. Um, and that went really well for her. So the combination of those two books really got her reading fluently and we moved on into literature programs. Um, by the time she was seven. Well, my youngest, however, is not reading at the level that her siblings were at her age. She is six, newly six, but by this point, both her siblings were reading pretty well, um, and I have been a little bit befuddled by it. So I'm actually revamping her reading curriculum. We had done, you know, teach your child to read in 100 easy lessons. We'd gotten to about less than 50. Um, we had done about half of the the reading lesson book, kind of like her sister. And I just wasn't seeing her pick up any kind of fluency with that. So I hemmed and hawed and thought about it. And we started doing all about reading um, level one last year as well. I had the old one, the black and white version. And it just wasn't clicking for her. Like she kept having to like practice with her consonant vowel, consonant words, her CVC words. And it just was not becoming fluid for her. So. I have been a little bit angsty about this, you guys, because I am not by any means an unschooler. I definitely value literature in this house. We have 10,000 books, if not more. And I have a little bit of stress about the fact that my youngest is not reading fluently yet. So we are going to be trying foundations um, from the logic of English. So I looked up her level and stuff and I ordered level B. My good friend, A Stitch in Time, at um, Instagram and also my good friend at uh, School Nest. They both um, have had success with the foundations program. And so I thought, you know, I'm gonna give this a shot. I'm gonna see whether this does the trick for her. I don't really believe in curricula being magical or doing the, the trick, but I do think that having 
different approaches is necessary when it comes to reading and math and science and history and everything. Because if you truly are not achieving progress, it is time to kind of look at what you're doing and say like, okay, for you and the way your brain works, you might need something different. So while I have said, I don't like teaching my kids like spelling rules and I don't like teaching kids like the rules of like phonics and things like that, I much, much prefer sort of going through and practicing and and blending and getting there, you know, just by sheer practice, like putting it together and magically having it click. I think that my youngest needs something different. I think that the rules might really help her. I think that type of logical framing might really help her. She's very strong in math. Um, the logic of numbers works in her mind really easily. So perhaps this is how she will achieve that goal. Or maybe she will just get there on her own because she will be developmentally ready for it next month or the month after and I will think it's this curriculum but whatever the fact is I will be happy about it. That is what's happening with my kids. In terms of science we are trying Real Science Odyssey for the very first time this year. We are going to be doing Bio 2 with my eldest and we are going to be doing Life 1 with the younger two kids. In science thus far, I have had a year with Nancy Larson Level 1 and I thought that was a great program. But in all honesty, it is a very expensive program. And so I really like how Real Science Odyssey is affordable. I like how you can get all of the materials for their lessons from home science tools. And I will link them down in the description box below because I don't wanna run around and order things. I just, it's not my life. And I also will not do experiments unless I have everything on hand. So I very much appreciate programs where you can have a box that has everything you need for the year ready to go. And so I've set that all up for the spring. I fully expect to do science this year and the way I'm going to do it is by assigning a day for science and that is Friday in our house. Friday, the first thing we will do is our science and hopefully we will get other things done as well, but I just want to work through science experiments in a way that doesn't let me make the excuse that, oh, today we have a hike and yesterday we had a party and da 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 da, you know? Especially as the world starts coming out of quarantine, I don't want to do what we typically do and let science experiments fall by the wayside. In previous years, we've had a science class that we go to that's run at this small little science shop and I've loved them. I think the best way to learn science is with a group. I think that the interaction of having different people's opinions, different people's hypotheses, really brings science to the forefront. You know, the way people can um, share their ideas about how scientific methods work um, how experiments work, how you can see how other people's minds work when they build something or create a chart or do an experiment, I think is very, very valuable in science, particularly at this age. For math, so. we're gonna continue with Math Mammoth as we always have. I really love that program. We had originally started my son on Singapore Math. Math Mammoth incorporates a lot of those mental math techniques, but also incorporates some of the rigor and repetition of something more traditional like Saxon Math. So I'm a big fan of Math Mammoth. If you haven't looked into it, I really do advise it. I have several videos up on my channel if you check out my math playlist so you can see all sorts of different levels of it. A lot of people don't realize that she actually has videos available that you can watch so you have that kind of math you see component. And she also includes a lot of links, I mean dozens of links, to different online games and things like that to practice the different chapter topics. We so. do supplement with a Becca for the youngest because she really likes the colorfulness of the workbook sheets and I think it's a really good review for her. I also supplement with Critical Thinking Company's Math Reasoning or Mathematical Reasoning because I think those are really good um, quick pages on like real world things like graphing and the introduction to basic algebra, you know, symbols instead of numbers for math problems, etc. Another thing we supplement with is Singapore Math Challenge. That's a really, really good book, you guys. The Singapore Math Challenge Word Problems book by Carson DeLosa. It's just one problem per page and it's just a word problem. And it really has 10 or 12 different problems per problem solving concept. Just more interesting problems, kind of like the problems you would see at like math competitions if you were a math nerd like me. They're not typical arithmetic problems or typical problems that you would see in a textbook. They're much more conceptual, much more um, advanced in terms of like advanced problem solving. And I think it's a good setup for what I plan to do for middle school for my um, kids, which is getting more into the art of problem solving books and Beast Academy type of 
theoretical match. Um, for history, we are doing Build Your Library Level 1 Ancients with the Younger Two, and we're doing Level 5 American History Part 1 with my eldest. I love Build Your Library. I think Emily Cook does an amazing job selecting her books. The complaints that I hear about Build Your Library are that some of the books address topics that might be difficult for sensitive readers. Personally, I think that there are lots of books that offer opportunities for discussion with your kids. I do think some kids, when they're younger especially, find topics like death and destruction and violence very hard, even in the in a book like Tale of Despero, for example. But I also think that there's a tendency sometimes to dumb down children's literature. And I think sometimes kids are more ready for these hard topics than we think. And these simple stories with animal characters, etc., that have these heavy topics, give our kids the opportunity to kind of rise to that and express their deeper emotions and really feel like not so alone in their own deeper emotions. So that's my two cents on that. But definitely pre-read the books that your kids are going to read, especially in the elementary school level. I think it's important that, you know, you know your kid best. So I think it's important for us to be aware of what we're presenting to them. We're combining it with River of Voices by Blossom and Root. It's been a little bit difficult to combine those two, I'll be honest. Some of the books overlap and are the same, so that's been easy. I find the Blossom and Root a little bit difficult to schedule in the, with the way that I think, the way that I process. I think if you're a much more unschooly type of person, it's great for you. However, I love all the multimedia things that the Blossom and Root curriculum makes easy for me to incorporate. For example, all of her links to YouTube videos and movies and shows, for my visual learner, it's really nice to sort of incorporate those things in as extras. So I have really appreciated that. And the way that I make time for that is by scheduling in one day for it. So Monday is going to be our history day. Friday is going to be our, our science day. And the priorities on those two days are going to be those things. So that's the day we do all those little extra pieces. Another thing that we're updating is our anytime basket. So Previously, I've had a series of books up on our anytime shelf, basically, and we kind of work through them haphazardly a little bit. I don't like that method as much anymore, so what I've done is I've created a schedule for myself where on different days, different topics are highlighted during anytime basket time, and I'm only going to have one book out per topic area. So for example, if on Wednesday, the anytime basket emphasis is on geography, we are going to look through and do as much as we can in that geography book than anything else. And it'll be for a designated amount of time, about 20 minutes or so. Another thing we're doing this spring is incorporating my project memory work. My beta testers have already tested out the first semester, which is about 12 weeks of content. The year is supposed to be 36 weeks of content. And the entire first year is ancient history but the science and math and language arts pieces sort of just progress logically from beginning to end. Another thing that we're doing is that we've joined the Kids Moon Club. Now we had started to do full moon walks already, so I figured this would be a nice seasonal rhythmic addition for us. For nature study, we do virtual classes with Our Journey Westward. We've done about four or five of them so far and really enjoyed them. So those happen twice a month and you can do them live or you can just watch the recording and we've done it both ways and it's been great both ways. I prefer it live because then the kids tend to pay more attention so they can answer questions and stuff. And that's been great. For music study, we're continuing to do Squilt. This will be our third year with Squilt. And every year the kids seem to get more and more out of it. I actually really enjoy Squilt because I don't know much about music theory and music history at all. And so I learned so much from those classes. And for me, that just makes it that much more fun. So that's about twice a month as well in live classes online. And let's see, what else do we do in terms of online classes? We are trying to do Waldorfish for art classes. We have never done an online art class before. This will be our first foray into it. I kept planning to start it last fall and I just didn't do it. So hopefully we will get that going um, this spring. It is really hard to do all of the things you want to do. And I find that things you actually end up putting into your schedule, the things that become easy to do are the things you actually enjoy. So that's why I really do recommend Swilt and I really do recommend our Journey Westwards nature study classes because those have been really easy for me to schedule in. We all look forward to it, we all enjoy it. I highly recommend them, I've done it for several years. I'll get back to you on how Waldorfish 
art classes turn out. And other than that, you know, like we go out with our little wild and free reject group and it's been great. Guys, so As always, I appreciate your time. Thanks so much for spending some of it with me. And I would love to hear about how you're revamping or continuing your homeschool plans for 2021. <laughs>